Welcome to the tokenomics workshop. Well, it's a workshop, so we should make it like a free flow discussion. So please drop your questions onto the chat or uh, prepare them and we'll have some time at the end. Uh, not really at the end, actually, because we're planning to just walk through the material within 15 minutes and then most of the time should be safe for a discussion. All right, so we've actually done a fair bit of work interviewing a lot of uh, investors and projects and working with founders over the past few years about tokenomics. And you can find that on a website, just a little bit of a show here, longhash.vc slash insights. Scroll down, a few resources, and you can see here the tokenomics blueprint edition 2021. It, it was released earlier this year, uh, but actually we were working on it since last year. And in fact, I think within six months now, we actually need to refresh it already. So today's session, I'm already going to bring in some fresh examples that uh, based on the recent developments in tokenomics. So let's walk through very quickly the major sections for our tokenomics blueprint. We're gonna have we're gonna talk about you know why tokens and then just quickly value creation, value capture, protection, supply and demand, and then just talk some risks and hurdles and then we go to questions. Yeah. So first things first, why token, when token, you know. What is it for? Right? All of these terms. The first thing that we always share with founders, uh, and this is consistent across uh, everybody's experience, is that you should not do a token just for the sake of it. You should not do a token just to fundraise. You should not do a token just because your investors are pressuring you to do it, your community is pressuring you to do it. There needs to be a very clear reason and very good design for it to be actually useful, right? I think we, we've seen like the terrible examples in the ICO days where it's about like fundraising. And, and after that, nobody uses the token. It's purely speculative and most of those projects die or they have to reinvent themselves completely with new tokenomics. So the, the most important thing before we start is to make sure that we need a useful product or service or value proposition or something that uh, people want to use or be part of or contribute to, right? And, and then the token is merely like the rocket fuel to supercharge those incentives and speed it up. So of course, that brings us to our first section, which is value creation. One of the most uh, interesting ways to use a token is to actually sweeten the deal uh, and accelerate uh, the adoption or growth of whatever you're building. And so we call that value creation, right? But strictly speaking, actually, whatever that you have created, the product, the service, the community, that is the thing that is creating value, right? The, the token is there to kind of accelerate it. So how do we do that? A few major categories. Of course, you want to, you can distribute it to the users. And this can be through various mechanisms, right? Uh, you want to do airdrops. You want to do like some sort of like incentive mining, liquidity mining. There's like front ends that actually mine it as well. So plenty of ways to distribute it to users. Next, users, uh, people who contribute to the protocol. So they, they may be building you know, new features, bringing you users, uh, any stakeholders you think that improve the product or service or platform, you can incentivize them as well. Usually this is done with a more kind of ad hoc basis, some sort of grants, uh, you're sponsoring uh, hackathons or you know, giving out bounties. So these are like usually how it's done for contributors or even like hiring new team members. And I think lastly, it's about liquidity as well. So it's not just the product, uh, not just like people who are using it uh, and people are building it, but also the token itself can be incentivized through various liquidity mechanisms. And here, I think you're, everybody's familiar with liquidity mining, um, but of course there are new mechanisms as well, such as bonding, which is what we see with Olympus Pro where you actually kind of like sell your tokens and, and to get liquidity and accumulate assets for the treasury. So these three broadly are how tokens can be used to incentivize or accelerate value creation and the mechanisms to actually distribute them specifically, there are, there are quite a few. <clears throat> I think bef before just to before all of this value creation thing, sometimes people just want to get their name out there. Uh, you want to do some price discovery. So often you want to do a direct sale as well. Uh, this is like actually 
it's doable without as well. I mean, it's possible to just purely do instead of mining or liquidity mining, uh, and then uh, go ahead and provide liquidity without doing a public sale. So, I mean, an example could be like Bitcoin, right? Like you, you've nobody ever had a public sale for Bitcoin, but for something like Ethereum, actually Ethereum had an ICO as well. Uh, they did it on Bitcoin network. So they allow people to con contribute with Bitcoin before they launch the network, but it's purely utility token. Once they launch, you just use it on the network itself. So it's possible, uh, it can make sense to, to do some direct sales just to get yourselves going, uh, but just be careful with uh, some of the regulatory concerns. So I think a lot of people will ask about how do you do sales here? We can, there are various mechanisms, we don't have to go to details, but balancers, liquidity, bootstrap pool, Dodo's crop pooling, various IDO platforms, coin list listing, the auctions on Sushi, be it the uh, batch auctions where uh, you everybody kind of like, you, you might get a very high valuation, but everybody gets in or Dutch auctions where uh, the uh, everybody can get in, but, uh, but the valuation might be uh, controlled. Sorry, if they get out of the way. Sorry, batch auctions means that everybody can can get in, but uh, the valuation, no, very few people can get in, but the, the valuations would be insane. Whereas Dutch is um, uh, the other way around. So aside from these, as I mentioned as well, there's the Olympus Pro mechanism for bonding. So, I mean, there's one way to accumulate your treasury as well. Next. Second section is going to be value capture. So first you want to distribute the tokens and then you want to make sure that uh, they have value, right? Why do people want to hold these tokens in the first place? If you're just giving them something useless, uh, there's no point, it's not an incentive. So to make sure they have value, we want to give these tokens use cases. So the first major category of use case is naturally governance. Everybody talks about governance tokens. So here, uh, having control of the protocol is arguably one of the values of the, of the token. Like one of the reasons people want to have the token. Uh, often it is not so easy to, to quantify the value of governance, but with some protocols, I think we're beginning to see the value of it, such as uh, with Curve, a lot of people are actually rushing to accumulate CRV tokens in order to kind of manipulate the gauge, the incentive gauge in their favor. So it can be done. Uh, but for most of the other use cases, more like to get people to chip in uh, with their proposals, with their involvement, with their contributions, right? And that gives a sense of belonging as well and ownership of the protocol. Uh, and possibly, you know, the governance can be used to switch on some of the other value capture mechanisms that we'll cover as well. The second major category is, of course, revenue. And this one is very dependent on your project actually having a revenue stream. So if it's a product or service, very clearly you can have revenue and therefore you can use the revenue to buy back the token uh, or it can be used to just be stored in the treasury and therefore the token via governance has indirect access to it or it can be used to give that directly back to the token holders. You might be wondering, okay, uh, which one is better? Uh, it depends on the stage of the project. Typically early on, there's the generally the idea of uh, buyback and nick where you, you do not kind of like give away those, that value so quickly you want to use it to reinvest just like how you would reinvest capital uh, in, in an early stage company and then later on when you have sufficient volume and revenue you might want to give some of it away yep it's covered and actually there there is a mechanism as well to to even create some sort of gating uh, to capture to capture the value of like people wanting to participate uh, or people buying the token. So there's also work token mechanisms and bonding curves. <clears throat> so these two necessitate people to like actually buy up the token in order to participate. But uh, I think there's an assumption here as well that there is sufficient users uh, in order for there to be people who want to acquire the token to provide that service. Bonding curves as well can artificially increase like the, the token price, uh, therefore to, to capture value in, in the purchasing demand of the token, but it can be used in, in carefully as well, given it locks up the liquidity. The last one here around value is value, is value protection. So here people actually usually don't talk about this. Uh, I think it's not, is underappreciated. 
because you, of course, want to distribute tokens to incentivize stuff, and you want to use token as a kind of a barrier to capture some of the value. But how do you can retain the users? How do you retain the liquidity? How do you keep people safe and you know, engage throughout the entire time? So this is what we call value protection, right? The first very obvious thing uh, is to protect the value of the token itself. So to protect the value of the token, you want people to, to hold it and to use it. And there are a couple of ways to do it. I mentioned just now the work token mechanism, but also you want to have staking mechanisms that can be tied to many of the other features, right? The staking can be tied to governance, the staking can be tied to uh, increased utility, so on. And staking can also be tied to the second category, which is uh, backstop. So the second category of library protection is around like smart contract uh, exploits or various financial exploits, civil attacks. Many types of attacks can happen. So you want to use your token to actually uh, be the cushion as well. So people who stake can uh, actually risk their tokens uh, as a backstop for inflation. It's been done for many DeFi projects. You can also issue tokens or like uh, allocates and to portion tokens for shield mining, where you incentivize people to provide insurance. So these two would kind of protect, uh, you kind of spending tokens to protect your, your protocol. And lastly as well, you want to make, pe make people engaged, make them stay and, and use, uh, use your product for longer. And so here you might want to have some sort of like calculation uh, for rewards for staying longer. It can be like the longer you stay, you get better things. You get snapshots with like different perks, airdrops, or you might even actually have uh, some sort of penalties if you kind of unstake early or if you sell early, right? Some, some projects actually do that as well. If you have a staked version uh, and you unstake very quickly, uh, or, or you are the first to unstick, or you're at first to unstick, you might actually get more penalties. So you can you can ask Diane from Dodo. They have the interesting staking mechanism. And after all the value stuff, the last thing I want to talk about is supply and demand. So we talked about how do you distribute it to create value, how do you capture value, and then retain all of that that's happening. But in this process, this is then we can start to envision this like dynamic cycle where tokens are being issued, they're coming back through like revenue, right? They're, they're being locked, they're staking, right? So the certain kind of like tokens going into circulation, coming out of circulation between the users and the protocol as well. So how do you think about like the balance so that you're not issuing too much tokens that will flood the market, uh, but at the same time, make sure there's enough liquidity for trading and all that. So here, uh, a general rule of thumb is that for earlier stage, it can be more aggressive, but we look at around 30% uh, inflation per year or up to 30% inflation per year. <clears throat> and then that can gen uh, gradually taper off over a span of like yeah, five to 10 years, depending on how quickly you want to distribute the tokens. Uh, it's, it's, it can be very subjective, right? And since most of the tokens are fixed supply, you have to think about a way to also cycle it through the system, right? Like if, if you're always giving it out, right? You need a way to, for it to come back if you want to continuously give out certain incentives, right? So you might need to do some buybacks. You might need to, I don't know, radically speaking, you could issue new tokens, uh, but you can capture some revenue as well uh, by in the native tokens uh, in some sort of way. And all these like allow the tokens to, to circulate. And I think one last thing about uh, supply and demand as well, which is for investors, the, in the beginning is quite an important thing to think about, which is the, the lockup investing. Generally speaking, uh, we've seen uh, two mechanisms, which is the lockout or the cliff, and then a vesting period. And they might be unlocked you know, at the beginning or after lockup or in between as well. So the cliffs generally can be a few months to a year. And vesting generally, I see like between one to four years. Uh, and depending on how you want to design it, you can also have some unlocks as well uh, up front or right after the clips. Uh, there, there's some, there's always this discussion around like, oh, okay, you know, how much we unlock for the team, how, how much we unlock for investors, or about users, should we airdrop it, should we unlock it and, and invest it? Uh, there's no right answer. Right? And often there's like a lot of archetypes around like, oh, people just dump straight away or like you want people to hold forever. And I don't, it's, it's often not so simple. Uh, and there are many shades in between. Like people sell some, people sell when it makes sense. Uh, and in the end, I mean, 
everybody needs to be financially responsible. So I think we cannot expect people to not sell forever, <laughs> uh, right? But then at the same time, we want to encourage the right behaviors. And the, so the best way to do this actually is to make sure that there's good utility, right? Supply and demand uh, in the end uh, is not just the mechanisms, but also how you engage uh, the community, like the narratives around the community, right? Like name coins, you know, there's just no lockout, whatever, but people are just like holding you know, forever, maybe even holding too much, like pass and end up holding the bags, right? Uh, because the narratives are, are so strong. So in the end, it's also not just mechanisms, but how you engage uh, people. All right. I think lastly, we talk about some recent hurdles, but I think these are like quite well known. It's less to do with tokenomics, it's more around like token projects in general. So I think we can cover them under questions. Uh, one thing I will say uh, when people ask about, or actually, maybe let me let me just save that and then go to questions first. First question: When Binance? <laughs> nice. Is this an actual question? Are you are you asking when should you do a listing, or how do you do a listing? <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't uh, uh, a serious question, but uh, yeah, I, I assume it's like one of the things that many people uh, will be asking for, right? Um, yeah. Whenever you launch a token, like when is it gonna come on like a major exchange? But maybe like now we're on the topic, like what would a big exchange need to be listed? I assume they won't be listing anything that's like vaguely possibly a security, um, but like what else is there that like exchanges look at? Yeah, there are generally a few things exchanges look for. Um, of course, like the qualifying criteria is that it can't be too obviously a security. I think if it's like a security token, you know, with like very clear promises uh, or like too scammy, like they won't list it, right? But generally, I think DeFi stuff is fine, like governance tokens, even things that have dividends, exchanges list them with no problem. So generally, I, I, I think it's okay. Um, the other thing, I think one thing to watch out for is like, what's the cost of listing? I think previously with like the ICO days, people were desperate to go on uh, centralized exchanges because it's the only way really to have liquidity. But nowadays, there's, so, there's tons of DEXs and bridges that technically speaking, you could, uh, skip the centralized exchange listing altogether. And then eventually, if they think it's good enough, they would like want to list you. Uh, I have also heard some things around exchange feedback uh, around token unlocks, as well as the distribution of tokens. If the team or investors control too much of the token, uh, exchanges will also be hesitant to list it because there is a risk that you know uh, you dump on them once they provide the liquidity for you. So generally, I think if we convince them that it's a legitimate product, tokenomics is uh, thought out well, and uh, I think some of them want to actually support like innovative projects as well, like good narratives and, and actually strong execution, then uh, you have a better chance of listing. Uh, but always remember, uh, you, it's not a must have actually. Yeah, you, uh, I hope that helps. All right, Rachel as well, legal hurdles with providing value capture. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, this oh. is just um, because like, obviously we, we really want to be able to like share like, you know, some of the value that we are capturing in terms of like the performance fees, et cetera, with our community, but like the legal advice we get so far is it's quite hard because it kind of pushes us into the realm of like, securities etc cetera, etc cetera. um so i don't know i mean it's obviously like a very broad question and of course it's like not like legal advice this is not like a legal uh call i i completely get that but i'm yeah. just thinking like like how like any kind of ways to kind of approach that or any sort of um good examples to look at to kind of overcome some of those hurdles that you could potentially uh, share some of the profits with your your like token holders, for example. Yeah, for sure. So far from what we've uh, seen and heard, I think the main thing to worry about is when you directly give uh, dividends or, or like issue kind of rewards to your token holders. If it's just a native token, like you stake and you get more of it or you provide liquidity and you get more of it, like that's fine. Uh, generally, you know, we, we don't see major crackdown, but if you like directly promise a certain return uh, and it's in cash, 
uh, and it's like very obvious in your kind of like, especially sale, then uh, that tends to be in more trouble. Um, but actually, broadly speaking, I think everybody's been expecting regulation to come to DeFi for the longest time. And there's been some hints of crackdown, but most likely it's going to happen to the larger protocols first. Uh, and they've set up, I mean, Uniswap has their own legal defense fund. Like, there are plenty of lobbyist groups which are like trying to clarify. In Singapore, uh, the, many of the largest DeFi projects have already engaged the regulators and engaged uh, like the sovereign funds to, to have discussions to help them understand uh, crypto and DeFi to make them understand that it's not, you're not promising something and delivering based on the centralized uh, uh, delivery. Uh, rather, it's kind of like, yeah, if people use it, then it goes directly to the liquidity <laughs> providers, right? There's, there's no kind of like um, intermediary that's actually uh, issuing that security. If it's like an automated thing that can happen. So uh, I think it's an ongoing discussion of the regulators. And so far, I, I don't see uh, much, um, I would say like panning or concern about it, uh, but definitely, the bigger pro protocols are preparing for it. So, you know, once once we you, you become a huge protocol, definitely invest in some legal defense. And I would say another thing, which is uh, once you're getting enough volume, I think that is the, exactly why it's DeFi. We need to decentralize. Uh, de putting uh, in place decentralized governance is not an option optional move, right? You need to actually give away control and governance uh, to token holders, to the stakeholders, uh, so that uh, you minimize the liability of, of a team that can like sort of snap over your fingers if you control the multi-sig train, the treasury, or like, you know, switch on uh, fees or, or, or somehow change the contracts if it's upgradable, uh, right? So you want to make sure all the uh, backstops are in place, like the, the um, controls are in place by the community and or a council or various uh, people who are contributing to the protocol. Oh, yeah, that's that's useful. That's some useful takeaways there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But in any case, I think like in the early stage, um, it's it's not so common to like give back um, revenue straight away uh, unless you're doing huge volumes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I know for example, like with with Ave that you stake Ave and then you get more Ave tokens. Like, uh, it could be something that, for example, if you're making uh, taking a fee in a different currency, then you convert some of that and then like buy back some of your own tokens and then give it to the like the people who are staking. These type of mechanisms might be something that you could want to look at, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the people who enable uh, these mechanisms early on, the projects tend to be uh, pseudonymous or anonymous, right? Because I think there is quite clearly a, a more security-like a feature of when, when you do that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think for, for founders who are known, who are not anonymous, uh, typically it's more we're, we're much more conservative, yeah, with yeah. giving dividends, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right, I, I have uh, some questions pre-prepared as well. There's one which is around uh, timing, I think somebody asked uh, me recently around when should you shoot a token, right? Uh, what what do you need to make sure it's in place? Uh, I think obviously, should you, should you do it pre-product, you know, should you do it like uh, when there are sufficient users? We always recommend to, to issue it when there are sufficient uh, post-product, uh, when the value proposition is clear and stabilized. And like the trick here is to nowadays actually tease some sort of airdrop so that like even when the product is live, before the token is live, there is a sort of a effect of token incentivization because people are expecting a token. So if we tease that announcement enough, right, you actually get the engagement and get the benefits uh, without uh, before you even do the token as you are preparing for it. And then when you're actually doing the token airdrop, the one thing to watch out for is to make sure you have utility at the same time when you're doing the sale uh, or when you're doing the airdrop. So that when people get the get the tokens, like the they can immediately you know stake it to get some utility. Immediately you know uh, choose to provide liquidity and, and get rewarded or, or use it in your product or service somehow. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to some questions from Guo. So Guo has asked, what are some classic examples or models of tokenomics, right? 
Would you like to elaborate a bit? Yeah, so I'm mostly thinking about what are some, because um, there's some of the classic example I'm thinking about like what Stimit did for, for their project. They have a pair of tokens and they have different functionalities. Um, and also for communities, I can think of an example like SourceCrete, where they design a community point versus um, how do you transfer that community point to token and how you use that token to go for governments. So I'm thinking, but, but both of these examples are not really good real world successful examples. Stimit is not so alive now and SourceCrete is theoretically feasible, but not applicable. We don't know what is applicable for to real world or not. So I'm thinking whether there are some good examples that has proven to be successful um, and we need to study close. Yeah, I think for you guys are in a bit of a, a unique situation and it's always kind of like tailored to you, right? So there are some templates, right. but you don't have to follow exactly. I think that the two major templates that have emerged uh, maybe a few, right? Uh, of course, layer one is its own template. So, but it's I'm not sure whether it's applicable. Uh, next is the DeFi protocol as a template, right? It's very clearly, you know, incentivized usage, liquidity, uh, and then you capture your fees because very clearly there's some financial products and then you can capture fees from that. Um, and then like that itself is a template. You add, in, add in governance and DAOs and so on. And then I think the, the latest template that's emerged is the gaming uh, model. So Xe Infinity has successfully decoupled a few aspects, right? With the ownership ERC-20, the assets, which are the NFTs, and then you have the in-game utility token, which is the currency. Uh, and they, de they decoupled the, the three parts and it works really well uh, when you put it all together. Uh, technically speaking, they only need the, the utility token and the NFT to work, right? but then in, they add the additional uh, ownership governance token to, to capture value and, and actually distribute for longer term kind of uh, stakeholders. So I would say these three are the main templates, but for you guys, right? And then it's about like coming back to the questions of like, what kind of uh, value do you want to incentivize? You know, is it you want users to come on and engage, create content, right? Do you need uh, some sort of like contributors to build out new features, bring new referrals, build new front ends, build integrations, right? Build new use cases uh, using your platform, right? Those can be incentivized ad hoc uh, with like hackathons, bound, uh, bounties, grants. Uh, and then, you know, you might want to then protect or retain some of the value, uh, right? Incentivize some sort of like liquidity, bonding, different types of things to actually protect the value of the token itself uh, or the protocol itself. So if you go through actually these questions, then you can think of like your own mechanism. Like what is it that you want to incentivize? Where can you capture value, right? Depending on the product or service they provide. Uh, there is one new thing that I think uh, for, for more, I think social applications, which is what Prestec is, is uh, and matters is like, which is the value capture. Uh, with the ones I talked about are, are very much like related to DeFi pro products, right? Because talk about governance, we talk about uh, revenue, uh, you might not have revenue. So there is a new category for value capture, which is status and permissions. So here people might pay or they might burn or give you some or lock out some of the tokens in order to get a certain status, right? They might want to get uh, into a group for token-gated content, into a premium kind of group. Or I might want to uh, boost my whatever rewards, show that uh, I am actually a, a valued or a big contributor in the protocol, right? Uh, and permissions uh, very tightly linked to status, uh, exactly as I mentioned, but you can actually represent it in, in different products as well. So for example, you could be uh, selling certain uh, NFTs, uh, using the native tokens. And the NFTs actually are for, uh, to show that you are a valued member or, or to give you like special rights and perks uh, when you're using the product or service or platform, right? So these actually don't depend on revenue. They depend on your social credit, how much people want to be associated with you and how much people want to be known as a, a, a somebody in your ecosystem. And you can monetize that as well. You can capture value for that as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, thanks for the comments. And, and that actually brings me to, to my next question. So um, when we are observing our system, we actually see at least two sets of functionalities and they're sometimes conflicting with each other. 
Um, so I said, on the one hand, we have the need of governance, right? We need to allow the user to vote and to say how they want the system to develop. But on the, that, so on this side, we mostly want to encourage the user to hold the token as much as possible because we want them to take a stake in the system. And we, as you said, we can also use it as a kind of a form of recognition or social status that users don't trade that much. They are more tend to hold, hold on to it. But on the other hand, we also need utilities um, that the user pay, for example, for pay what content, um, this kind of thing, which needs them to be able to trade, to buy and sell, and also use the token as fast as possible with as least as less scarcity as possible. So on the first one, we probably would need um, a good governance um, ecosystem, for example, like Aragon. Uh, for the second one, we probably need a, a low gas fee chain, for example, like uh, Polygon or, or similar um, side chains. So um, at least there are these two sets of utilities. Um, so I'm wondering, is that a common differentiation or are there more patterns of kind of um, subsetting the tokens or the needs of the tokens into categories? Yeah, yeah. I think since uh, Axie Infinity, it's been validated that uh, it can make sense to separate out the function of governance and, and the function of like utility of using the product. In most DeFi protocols, it's kind of like merge the one thing, right? Uh, you know, you, you use it to, uh, but actually, yeah, it's more like rewards, like incentives, and then like, it's actually like governance and then provide liquidity. So it's, it's its own kind of like bundle, right? But it's possible to unbundle it. Uh, and the way you do it is by separating out how you distribute and how you capture for these two. So now you have to think of it separately for these two, right? And for the utility token, typically, sure, you can, you can distribute it with like engagement usage. So it's like very fast moving, but you also need somewhere where people want to buy it uh, or people would want to lock it out or transfer it to somebody else. They need a reason to do that, right? In XC, uh, the reason for that is uh, breeding. So, you know, I can earn the tokens by playing my axes in the games I earn the SLPs, but then other people want to buy it from me because they want to breed more axes. And it, it kind of like, it's a little bit uh, self circular. And of course the music can stop if nobody wants to breed new axes, right? But at least uh, there is a very clear uh, loop going on, right? And uh, for, for the utility token, if you want to make it high velocity, uh, and you just need to keep it relatively stable is probably the use, then you can actually have a more aggressive supply. Uh, and as long as the demand matches that, you know, it's relatively stable, you don't need it to be store value. Whereas for the governance token, you might want to be more careful with it because you might want to think that like, oh yeah, maybe all my users, it doesn't really make sense for them to, to be uh, to be owners of the protocol. Maybe you only want to incentivize people who are using it for a long time or hit a certain threshold or, or, or provide actually valuable kind of posts. There's some sort of curation going on. Uh, so uh, with that, you can be more picky in how you distribute it, right? It doesn't have to be programmatic. Maybe it can be ad hoc. Uh, you can decide, you know, nominate or, or, you know, you choose the first few ones or you use some sort of like competitions and, and hackathons to decide. And then you give those people to the government tokens. So that's what actually is doing, right? They actually give out the government's tokens in the tournaments themselves. Uh, or they gave out to like very long time players and supporters uh, or people yeah, uh, who have yeah, contributed significantly. And then the value for that is, is governance and uh, staking, uh, which actually gets you more tokens as well as a claim to the revenue that comes through. So yes, absolutely doable, but think of the two different loops, right? And think of the different uh, levels of supply and demand for, for the two loops. So utility, high supply, high demand, like high insurance. Uh, whereas for governance, it can be like lower supply because like the demand is like, uh, you know, people don't necessarily need to buy it, right? So it's more like spec either speculation uh, or they aren't actually contributing to governance. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. All right, that's helpful. Is there any point that you'd like to clarify there? Um, no, so, yeah, I, I think that my, the, the, the part of that I'm confused about, um, not, I guess nothing to clarify, but it's just something where they're starting to think about that. Like, even in the utility function itself, there are uh, probably different needs. Um, so like, how do we, 
how do we decide whether we should bundle them into one token or should we separate out into different tokens? For example, there are tokens that users use to exchange within themselves as just as a medium of value. Um, there are tokens where are tied to a specific NFT. For example, we have a NFT that it has embedded rule that it automatically exchange uh, when certain um, condition happens. And so basically there's a token behind it as well. So for example, should we tie those two tokens together or should, the, should we just separate them and basically like one token per project? Um, so these kind of decisions are, are kind of our daily uh, decisions. So it's very hard to make some kind of wondering whether are there are some patterns or, or playbooks that people use to, to decide whether um, to separate out different tokens or combine them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, generally, you know, if, if you don't talk about utility, then if it's uh, what I, I kind of like hear from you that like there'll be many utility tokens. Are like you talking about tens, hundreds? Right, so we're not sure whether that should be the case or not. Uh, for yeah. example, for, for one of our projects now, we need a utility token behind it, we, but we're not uh, marketing it as a token. Uh, the user mm -hmm. basically don't even know there's a token behind it. It's the only thing they know that the NFTs are automatic trading but there's actually a token happening behind it. Um, so we're, we're thinking, are we, should we in the future market, it as, market this token as a token and use it as a utility token for other usage as well? Or should we just contain the usage of this particular token inside this particular app or this particular um, uh, project and then use other tokens when we need some new ones? Um, or, or is that more powerful to combine them together or is it more powerful to separate them into different um, smaller projects or smaller applications. Yeah, I think this one is very specific to project, so we have to go into more detail <laughs> actually. So, uh, what what is the token that uh, is behind and, and it's uh, automatically transferred? What are you referring to? Um, so, for one example, we're implementing a project with um, the so-called Hubberger tax. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, uh -huh. with that. So, so, it's basically a higher value that allow data tax. Yeah. Right, right. So in order to uh, implement that, there has to be a user has to have an account from which automatically you gain taxes from that account, and you also give back the taxes to that account, and that account basically form a ERC twenty token, right? Because you have the balance, you have uh, the, the transfer. So it's it's a token embedded in this logic. Um, so we need to issue that token to the users, but in the first uh, at first, that account only used as a saving account. So the token is strictly speaking stable uh, comparing to Ethereum, um, but it's, it is still a token. So the next step for us is a question, should we market it as a utility token or should we just not, not even require the user to understand it as a token and then move on to other projects and then issue the token as we go. Uh, so it's kind of, should we combine different tokens or should we separate it out into different components? Yeah, generally speaking, if, uh, if the user doesn't need to know about it, uh, then technically there doesn't need to be a token, right? Like if, if, if a user needs to, wants to know, uh, and that usually means that they can either take this token and use it somewhere purposely, uh, manually, or they can, they can either sell it, right? Or they can go in and like stake it or they can go and use it with different DeFi protocols, right? Be like, lend it out, put it in a basket, whatever it is. Uh, if they're not going to manually do that, and it's kind of like things are happening on the back end and it's more of your own internal accounting. Right? I, don't, I don't see necessarily a need for, for that to be tradable, all right? It's different though if you want to add in some sort of uh, multipliers or you want to add in some sort of... Um, permissions right maybe you only get that if you have a certain uh, number of tokens or you have some nfts uh, then then maybe that can make sense right if you want to differentiate the accounting mm. so that might be something to consider uh, i think it, yeah i think that is that token and, and then you mentioned there may be another token that each pulls as its own token or something like that but i presume it's all uh, the same uh, utility token right yeah okay okay yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So yeah, uh, the reason to have the token is like people want to know it, uh, they want to own it, use it, 
bring it somewhere else, right? That's the whole idea of Web3, right? You want to make it composable that this right. token can then be a, one of the assets that can be plugged into other, any other DeFi Legos, any other uh, plug into any other NFTs or DAOs and, and make it work. If it's just going to be internally circulating, it, it may or may not need to, to be a token. Right? Unless right, you know right. they need to go and sell it to another player or another user, then like it can make sense. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. In our case, it's it's actually we whether we're marketing uh, it as storing money in the account or transfer into a token. Because with our implementation, the user can they are actually when whenever they're using this protocol, they're transferring their Ethereum to our token. But we can market it, market it either as they're transferring to this token or they're storing their Ethereum in this particular account. So it's underlying the implementation, underlying implementation is the same. They're all a ERC20 token that's stable with Ethereum. But we're just determining how to market that and how should we allow the user to understand it. But but what you said makes sense. Like it, it depends on whether we want to allow the user to plug in this token into the rest of the ecosystem or not. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to go into detail of your project later on or right. separately. Uh, but yeah, definitely think about the composability, right? Uh, that's, that's the whole reason yeah. it's useful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you also had another question, the last one about uh, strategies to do with high and fluctuating gas fee. Uh, it's actually less tokenomics, but you know, uh, happy to help, right? What are you uh, wondering here? Yeah. So um, it's, it's also in some cases we need very high frequency of trading and, and um, transaction. Uh, yeah. Whether it's you, donation between users or it's, for example, like uh, paywall usage uh, between users. Yeah. The typical usage is like uh, less than $5 or less than $2 per transaction. So in that transaction, Ethereum um, is definitely a, a bad place to, to do that. Um, so so I'm, I'm thinking, what are some common strategy um, to, to avoid the high and fluctuating gas fee? I yeah. guess one strategy would to be issuing the token on a chain with the lowest gas fee. Sure. Um, but I think in terms of token economics design or product design, are there some common strategy to, to, to kind of lower the gas price or make it less a problem? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So the, the, actually one of the, the easiest ways is to batch uh, transactions together. So this one, you will sacrifice a bit of the, the product maybe because you, you're not able to do all the microtransactions in real time. But uh, let's say you accumulate it in a certain period and then you make it executed in one go uh, with like one transaction. So that may have some gas savings. Uh, I've seen some like do aggregators as well. So for example, you aggregators, you want to compound, right? So every time you want to compound, it should pay gas. So it's actually really expensive if you want to keep it compounding and it may not even make economic sense for you to like pay to compound because you have to pay gas every time. Uh, so. Uh, some ways around it is that um, like it's also kind of batched, but it can be like, maybe you don't need to pay for it. Like, so in, in the new aggregator example, like here, the, if you start, uh, if anybody kind of like puts money in uh, or removes money, then like that transaction itself actually triggers like the compounding. So like a, a user who is going to pay gas anyway, will actually kind of like socialize the cost of like everybody's compounding. Right. Uh, or this uh, compounding can also be triggered by with a certain kind of rewards pool. So if, if you have certain revenue or certain like token rewards, you can say that you know it's accruing over time, and then somebody can like pay to to uh, to claim it, but they have to pay gas, which triggers this all the microtransactions which happen. I think I've seen an example of that on Avalanche as well. Uh, so yeah, it, these are kind of a couple of ways to solve it without uh, moving chains. Uh, there are more drastic ways, which is, of course, move it to a different chain, uh, right? Low gas fees. Or in like, for example, Axie's case, they, they just built their own chain. Right? They just forked it and, and made their own rodent chain. And actually, uh, that uh, brought a lot of more users because it was a lot more user-friendly. And I think lastly, if, let's not rule out the possibility that if you don't need it to be composable or whatever, it can maybe be off chain. I think we've seen some sort of like loyalty yeah. points calculation off chain as well. If you can still verify that, uh, you know, make sure the logic is correct, you know, make it transparent, or maybe have a few people to replicate it somehow, uh, have some sort of verification, then uh, a proof, uh, provable kind of like a, a 
publishing on chain afterwards. It, it can work as well. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think combining the logic off chain and what you just mentioned, someone can trigger that set of off chain um, transaction, move them on chain, and pay for the gas fee would be a nice logic. Yeah. Yeah. All that's possible. Yeah, anything else from you, Guo? Um, yeah, so I, I guess the one last one for me is, is that um, how important is it to list a token on a centralized exchange when DEX are so widely available? Uh, because it, it feels like DEX are one more popular now, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and as long as you can provide a liquidity pool, the exchange is already there. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious about what are the added value or how important it is to be listed um, um, on a centralized exchange. Yeah, yeah. Uh, le much less important than it was uh, a few years ago. So I think exactly as we mentioned just now, and as you has, have mentioned, because DEXs are working well, uh, and also there are many bridges, there are scaling solutions. If you want to have your token on a, like a lower gas, higher transaction throughput chain, uh, like you can have various activity or token liquidity without a centralized exchange. So the, the power dynamic has uh, shifted in the project's favor, right? Like uh, centralized exchange is no longer the only place where tokens can be traded or have uh, utility or even go cross chain. So now if you have sufficient liquidity, you have a way to, to incentivize sufficient liquidity or bootstrap it, uh, you don't necessarily need a centralized exchange. So, I, I mean, I, I think it's still, it can still be helpful uh, if uh, to if you want you know a lot of a trading activity to happen right typically the experience is smoother there's still a lot of users there uh, still a lot of liquidity that is provided to centralized exchanges so it can be helpful but it's no longer super essential yeah that makes sense thank you yeah especially if you, you know a big kick-ass product you know get get a lot more users and you know, shift the negotiations in your favor. I think the exchanges want to list your token, you know, <laughs> by themselves, right? It should happen to... naturally. Exactly. Like it shouldn't yeah. be kind of like, oh, going there, you know, you, you have to sacrifice how many percent of your tokens to give them or pay them how much just to like, please put me on the exchange, right? It's no longer that kind of story. Yeah. Right. Cool. Um, Nandit and Ravish, we haven't heard from you guys yet. And Mike, Mike as well. Uh, anything from you guys? I do have a question around, you know, uh, even if we make, you know, a utility or a governance token, we are yet to come up to that point. But we were thinking that uh, in Lighthouse, we might be, you know, heavily dependent on, let's say, Filecoin infrastructure. So we might be, you know, a timely manner, we'll have to pay in Filecoin to the miners. So how do we deal with that? Maybe, you know, at the front, our users might be using a tokens related to Lighthouse, but then should we need to, do we need to create a market with this another token or a protocol that we are dependent or that we are using? Do you yeah, think? sorry, what's the question here? Yeah, like we have this, let's say we have this Lighthouse token and yeah. utility, but yeah. on the other end, we are, you need to use another token, uh, like fill, right? Because you want to pay for storage. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, you can you can have a backend dex that um, automatically swaps whatever uh, into into fill, right? I think this part of the extraction for abstraction for the users, uh, if they want to do so, either paying your native tokens or paying an ETH or paying in stable coins, and then uh, at the backend you can actually lock in the price and do the transaction, uh, so they can pay for the fill. I mean, ideally speaking, uh, the best case is there's a red fill. So there's one-to-one, -one, there's no slippage. So that would be ideal. Uh, and if there's some liquidity pools there, that would be perfect. Okay. So on that note, like, uh, who creates that liquidity pool? Like, between, let's say, our token and the Filecoin token? Who would create that? But why, why do you need liquidity between your token and Filecoin token? Are you assuming people will pay in your token? Yeah. Uh, you want them to pay in your token? I guess maybe we are not uh, sure that right now uh, if payment should be in our token because Filecoin itself is 
natively on another chain filecoin chain itself and our smart contracts might be on ethereum or polygon let's say so uh, yeah. but there yeah. needs to be a market between maybe our token and filecoin so that yeah we can convert it into their um generally i would be very careful with using tokens for payment um if it's if it's going to be immediately converted to something else i think a lot of utility tokens in the ico days were were payment tokens right like you pay for the service in this token and in order to get the service you have to first buy the token and then you pay it and then once i pay it is immediately converted to another token so it's, like, it's kind of like cancels out it's net zero right <laughs> there's there's like it doesn't accrue value to to the protocol right it's it's yeah. much better like if you're going to pay in fill anyway it's much better they just pay in fill and then you and then you take a cut from that and then that, that becomes your protocol revenue, right? Or if the, if you really abstract it, you know, lock, lock in the code in stable coins, right? You have to do the conversion. Uh, maybe you take a bit of premium there as well, right? There's protocol revenue. Like rather than having like your own token in between, it becomes net zero. It becomes like an unnecessary barrier for users. Yeah. So yeah. As, as you can see from, from, from the various mechanisms I talk about, like, you know, value creation, capture protection, right? What does it having as a payment do, right? It doesn't, you know, create value. I'm not sure, um, right? It's, it's not, you're not giving away. That's a capture value. Uh, not really because it's net zero out. <laughs> like you have to buy and then you sell it. So it's one-to-one, -one, there's, there's no. There's a protect value, not really. I mean, it introduces another like swap and gas. <laughs> and so like, it, because it doesn't satisf satisfy any of the questions. Uh, personally, I don't think it's a good use. Yeah, probably it would be like, maybe some part of it, it is going to uh, the file coin for the DE payments and other is being used uh, within the protocol mechanisms. So yeah, yeah, I do yeah. Point that having one to one wouldn't make sense. Yeah, um, yeah. So think about it, right? Think about it. Yeah, uh, around like how does it actually create value or, or you know help you capture or protect value, right? Uh, because using it pay as payment is it's just like a it's just a velocity thing. I mean, unless every yeah. like the only uh, way that I see that making sense is like either, you know, the issuance of it, like you're a stable coin issuance and then like the issuance you capture value there or you're like a layer one, right? You're BTC or your ETH, right? Every transaction you are like, you actually pay BTC to transfer BTC or you pay ETH to transfer ETH, right? Like, so every transaction actually you are either burning or accruing certain, uh, you capturing certain value of the token itself. So like that, uh, that can make sense. But for most applications, paying with tokens is, uh, Got it. Very often not a great idea. Okay, so you can think about it. Um, I want to save some time for, for either Rubbish or Mike as well. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I have a, uh, this is more of like, a, I wanted to ask about like, that's a, um, like there's a protocol like a, that, that create a, a cost ecosystem they have and they have like suite of product together. For example, here like um, Pancake Bunny, um, there's very, very, very large TBL on, on BSC, uh, yeah. they they also like Pancake Bunny. They also create like Qubits and uh, another one I don't remember. But like, I just want to know your thought about on 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 this. That's like they they have like three tokens, right? They actually like shipped over by the same team called like Moon Moon Team, and the team has the token ND. Also have like the token for Pancake Bunny, and they also have another token for. Uh, that's Qubit, which is compact form. So, what would you think about like this, this, this type of, um, of like this that they try to create an ecosystem? And they have like, a token for like, all that product, like one for all, for all ecosystems. So, there's like protocol level tokens, and they also like a, a um, like ecosystem, that ecosystem tokens. Yeah, just wondering what your thought on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mike. A little bit breaking off, but I think I, I caught the gist of your question, which is like, if you have multiple products, does it make sense to have multiple that's right, tokens? That's right. Right, and then so that uh, it can, it can. But I, I will be careful, right? I will, I'll, I'll yeah. share some some pros and cons for 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 that uh, model. Right, the pro is that you have a blank slate. You're very flexible in how you design a new kind of like, you know, issuance and capture and, and protection and supply and demand, right? You, you have a new fresh canvas to play with if you do that with every new product. So that can be very tempting. Um, at the same time, I'll be careful because the, there are some cons as well. Like it seems very good, but it, every new token requires you to spend time and, and energy to 
design the mechanisms, right? Educate the community, make sure there's liquidity. There's a lot of overhead in terms of like right, time right. and effort to get it up and running and maintaining it, uh, you know, engaging community, make sure there's liquidity and token value is like maintained. So like that part, right, may or may not offset like the flexibility that you get. Um, what, what, how it can make sense is yeah. that uh, if it's a sub down model, where like you have an overarching kind of like incubator or, or like a group of uh, builders and then you have a core product, okay? And then you have a, a sub product that you have a dedicated team to, to manage that. And then because you need to incentivize a new team and it becomes its own kind of like platform, its own ecosystem in the future, then yes, we have seen quite a few that like they spin off as a new project and therefore you airdrop, uh, you have a new project that's associated, right? You airdrop to the original kind of like project, you know, you have your own dedicated team, you have your own tokenomics and you can incentivize your own ecosystem and contributors and users in that way. And it makes more sense because then you have a dedicated uh, team that can think about and maintain and engage with that community. Right, right. And then what do you think about like the sort of like ecosystem um, token, right? For example, like um, uh, let's say it's like, if, like the first, the, the first company have like a token and they spin off another one, right? Uh, for example, let's say it's like Alpha, right? They have like yeah. Alpha, right? And they, they launch another one called Beta, which is managed by a separate, separate team. What, what about like, uh, if they have the model kind of like uh, another token on, on the umbrella of the whole thing, like similar to like Pancake Bunny, I, I just, so for me personally, it doesn't make sense to have like the ecosystem token, but just want to know your thoughts on that. It makes sense for me to have the token for the products, right? But not the ecosystem. I, I, I just couldn't wrap my mind around like why that, but like people just keep buying it. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think the first example I gave was more like if you have your own core product and you actually the core product uh, actually creates value and captures value. And then from yeah. there you spin off, right? Then, then right, it can make right. sense. If you talk about many products and then like all of them have their own token and you actually have a, a, a top yes. token, then yeah. uh, in that case, there may not be a product, right? Mm -hmm. you, you may not need a product for the ecosystem token. To me, that is more like a DAO. So right, right. it can make sense if you're purely thinking of it as like a DAO governance, you know, mm -hmm. uh, DAO adventure, DAO of sorts, you know, of like builders. And you're either putting right. your money or like incentivizing builders to like incubate new products and coming out. Uh, but yeah, it, it will be very different, right? It's more around the people I if, you're not, if you don't have a core product. I see. I see. Yeah. So in that case, right, you want to, if it's purely a DAO, you want to think about who do you want in the DAO? If you have a lot of random people right. who are not going to contribute to the, the products, right? Do you want them as members of the DAO? Right, right. So, so I, I think it's like from what you say, it actually makes sense that way if it's construct as a DAO first on the, the top ecosystem um, um, tokens, right? And then like you use that DAO fund to, uh, let's say like funnel down onto like uh, a product in the, That's based right. on the building from that ecosystem. And then the DAO member get, let's say the, um, the token from the, the product that uh, this was created and the benefits coming back to the DAO. Okay, yeah. that, that do make sense. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. That's, that's all for me. Thanks, Kikai. Okay, sure, Mike. So it's nice to hear from you. Yeah. All right. All right, I think we are about an hour. Yeah, pretty much on time. So anybody has any other questions they'd want to ask? Um, I have like one um, short question on, like, I'm not sure if it was covered that my connection uh, was gone for a few minutes, but it relates to which chain you want your main token to be living on or where you want the liquidity to be on. So, yeah. I'm not, yeah, if it's already been covered, sorry for that. No, 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 it's not, it's not been covered. It's not been covered. Yeah, yeah this so, is... Uh... Yeah, because we're, we're, we're living in this multi-chain world now, right? Like you have users on one chain, liquidity on the other one, uh, like a good ideal platform on even another one. So it would be good to have your thoughts on this. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a quite a, quite a important and also tricky question. And often, I think people who are building on other chains, which are not Ethereum, uh, you know, have this temptation to to actually build their tokens on Ethereum. Uh, like to me, I think the questions I would think about is uh, firstly, where is my core community? Right, where do I want my primary token holder base to live on? Right. If I'm building very natively for this particular chain, 
and then I want to I want the, the token to like first live on this ecosystem so that like any kind of like integrations are like very native and like uh, token itself, the token contract itself and is governed on this chain, right? That's where the governance happens and the main proposal today happens. Uh, but if my main point is to go multi-chain, then technically it can live on anywhere. Then you might want to think of like where you, most of like the users and composability are. And I think the answer is pretty clear. It's actually like the biggest network effect still EVM based chains. So it may or may not need to be on, on layer one, uh, but if it's EVM, it's a lot easier to, to move around on a multi-chain world. Uh, increasingly, that's less and less true because there are many bridges that can actually go to non-EVM chains as well. So I think in the future, it's going to matter less and less. Uh, but in right now, it still kind of matters, right? Where your primary user base. Uh, another consideration I'll think about is like, you know, if you're going to bridge over, then, uh, you know, how, how are you going to do uh, the other counterparty tokens, right? You know, are you going to have some sort of like wrapped version? Who's going to maintain a wrapped version? How did, how's it going to be liquidity for like the wrapped versions and the different multi-chain versions, right? Is it going to be decentralized? Is it going to be custodial? Uh, and all of that becomes quite cumbersome to manage. <laughs> it's actually quite uh, troublesome as well. So uh, that I have seen, yeah, so it, it would be good to, you know, focus on focus on one chain, right? And then if it's if it, EVM chain, perfect, right? It's easy to, to bridge over. It's already recognized as a standard. Uh, but if it's not EVM chain, it's a lot harder to, to <laughs> recognize as a standard. You need like rep versions and all that. Uh, uh, there, there is some, well, one last thing, which is if you have, if you have your, if you have a multi-chain token, there, there is one mechanism that some projects are doing, which is a bit radical, right? Which is that you have your token on one main chain and then you have it on a non-EVM chain or, or fork or whatever, a new token. <laughs> so you can have a new token for each chain and uh, that new uh, implementation can, uh, similar to the subtle model that uh, Mike was talking about, do some airdrop back to your uh, original token holder base so that the accounting and like the, the tech is like a lot cleaner uh, in that sense. But that is a rather radical approach that it's not super validated yet. But the, I think I, I know of a few projects thinking about this multi-chain approach, right? A completely fresh token supply. Oops, did we lose you? No, no, I'm still here. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So no, no definite answer. But I think in the short term it matters. <laughs> yeah, it depends. Like I agree. Like the the EVM composability is quite nice, but yeah, who knows what uh, like future bridges um, may enable. Yeah, so, yeah okay. it's definitely gonna definitely gonna be solved. Yeah. All right. Thank you everyone for your questions. I hope this has been insightful, and anybody watching it, I hope it's insightful as well. Uh, I, I do not claim to be the absolute uh, expert. I think it, the, the scene is changing every day. So if, if you have anything new you would like to share with the cohort, you know, uh, with us, uh, please share as well. I think we can all benefit from learning from each other. And there's it's evolving so fast that we definitely need to refresh our blueprint very soon. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Yep. And as always, you, uh, you know, we, we can continue the conversation. It doesn't have to stop here. So if you have any further questions after this, uh, drop them in Slack or drop them in Telegram. And uh, yeah, we'll get back to you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. See you soon. Thank you. That's super helpful. Yeah, thanks, guys.